Welcome to the COLLEX High Level Forum on Investment Contracts. The conference will be held in English with Spanish and French translation available. My name is Thomas Henschel and I have the honor to guide you through these two days as your moderator. An international mediator based in Berlin, Germany, I have supported negotiated agreements for sustainable production in several sectors in Africa, Southeast Asia and the Americas. Before we start with our first speaker, please let me very briefly introduce you to the forum's design and share a few thoughts and provide an overview of our program. Why do governments need negotiation support? Multinational companies have entire teams that only concentrate on negotiation contracts. Most governments simply do not have enough experiences in negotiation complex commercial contracts. Negotiation support provides balance at the table, ideally leading to better deals for everybody. Just a few thoughts about our topics. The raw material sector drives the economy in many emerging countries. Well negotiated and implemented investment contracts are crucial to a country's development. Contracts are generational in scope, lasting 25 to 30 years. What one generation negotiates will have an impact on the next generation. So governments must consider tomorrow's potential impact today. Climate change, sustainable infrastructure, just transition, and the impact contract negotiation support can have are all very complex issues. To further our understanding of complex issues, a multi-perspective lens is needed. Therefore, we are pleased that our forum has attracted such a diverse group of distinguished guests and participants. With so many different perspectives, public and private sector, legal, financial aspects, technical, social and environmental, just to mention a few, we are confident that we can explore the challenges, ambiguities and contradictions of each topic to create a comprehensive view. We will learn from experiences in the field, what went well and what could be improved. And we will challenge existing concepts and narratives on our search for more focused questions and to create new approaches and better strategies. All participants will have the opportunity to engage in the discussion. A question function exists, which my co-moderator Sun Min will be monitoring to feed as many of your questions into our Q&A sessions. Our ambition will not just be to rethink, it is also to implement. To create something new, and that's what we all need right now, we must go beyond what is likely to happen. We need to create what is possible, as the economist Alfred Hirschmann framed it. That's our ambition. It may be a topic, but we should not shy away from that. This indeed is transformation. Our program follows these thought and will look at all issues from different angles and with our ambition to identify strategies that will make a difference. Today is dedicated to contracts as levers for sustainable infrastructure, and tomorrow we'll focus on contracts and addressing climate change. Again, welcome to Connex High Level Forum. For those of you who just joined, we do have Spanish and French translation. The conference language will remain English. And I now have the honor to present our first speaker to you, Dr. Bergel Kofler. Bärbel is Parliamentarian State Secretary to the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development. She has extensive experience in human rights policy and humanitarian aid, leading both issues as a commissioner at the Federal Foreign Office. Please welcome Dr. Bärbel Kofler. Bärbel, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the ELMO Summit in 2015, the G7 reaffirmed their support for the CONNEX initiative. The aim was for countries of the Global South to benefit from their own resources. Investors often have more know-how and financial resources than the countries themselves. This puts them at a clear advantage. That is why the investment contracts that countries and companies conclude for major raw materials projects are not always fair. 
Connex was aimed at evening out th these deficits and offering partner governments tailor-made multidisciplinary expertise to achieve fair and solid contracts that are equally advantageous for both sides. And now, with the G7 presidency back in Germany's hands again, a first chapter has been completed for Connex. And the record for the time since 2015 has been a very positive one. Connex has assisted 20 partner governments with 25 projects in mining, infrastructure, and renewable energies. Connex experts have provided advice in many ways on decommissioning mines in an environmentally responsible manner, renegotiating price models, and preparing international tenders. With support from Connex, the government in Panama renegotiated a contract with an international mining company. The New Deal guarantees extra revenue of 375 million US dollars a year for the national budget for the next 40 years. In Liberia, the renegotiation of a pricing agreement for an iron ore project generated revenue of up to 17 million US dollars for the country, a 24% increase in revenues. These are real success stories. In order to meet challenges such as a climate change in future, strong investment is needed in the raw materials of a climate neutral transformation. The expansion of renewable energies and of e-mobility will trigger a new rush for resources. The World Bank is expecting an increase in demand for critical minerals of up to 500% by 2050. Fair contracts will enable us to ensure that the extraction of resources contributes to the economic development of the producing countries. This means, more than ever, well-negotiated and fair investment contracts are essential for achieving the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Goals. I'm happy that this forum is exploring the role of complex investment contracts from different angles. You are all enriching the debate with the expertise you bring from politics, research, industry, and civil society. Some of our partner countries will be giving first-hand accounts of their experience gained in contract negotiations. With the startup financing provided by Germany since 2015, Connex has grown into an internationally acknowledged service provider. Many of you have been supporting Connex in its development with advice and in a practical way. And I want to say thank you for that. I would like to especially commend the European Commission for its financial commitment. I hope that this successful cooperation will be continued. I would like to invite our G7 partners and other potential partners to join the donor community for the Connex Initiative. Let us secure the long-term success of the Connex Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Bärbel Koffler from the German Ministry for Cooperation. Uh, and thank you for your opening remarks, in which you highlighted the importance of negotiation support and also the cooperation with the EU Commission, and also mentioned some examples of success Connex Consulting, like the Panama case or the Nigeria case. So we just learned that contract can be transformative, but what exactly is the case for investment contracts? This leads us to our first round of panelists. Time is running out when it comes to climate change and sustainability. Some argue that a total reboot of whole human interaction with nature is needed. Contracts could play a major role in this transition. We are talking about a transition to a green economic, creating prosperity for everybody and preserving the value of nature for future generation. We must talk about the just negotiation of contracts, stopping the resource colonization. What would a true partnership and a culture of dialogue look like? Who needs to participate? How must negotiations be done to create better outcomes for everybody and not just a few? Questions that relate to the principle of how we do business and live together as one people on one planet. In our first panel, we want to highlight and emphasize the dimension and importance of contracts for these diverse and sometimes contradicting challenges. For such fundamental question, one needs to have the best experts available. 
I'm pleased to welcome our three distinguished guests to our first session on the case for transformative contracts. Let me briefly present them to you. First of all, I'd like to welcome Director Dr. Kamu Kisha Kasura from the African Union. Welcome here at our forum. He is the Director for Infrastructure, East African Community Secretary at the AU. And Kamu Kisha represents not only the African Union, he has vast experience in infrastructure programs in East African communities. And what I like most also, he knows also the private sector quite well. So he knows both sides, public and private sector. Um, we are really honored that you could join us, especially on short notice since the commissioner had on the last minute um, to, 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 to go to another um, issue. But thank you very much for being so flexible and for joining us. We are really looking forward to your contribution. Then I'm really honored to welcome Sir Paul Collier, Collier or Collier. <laughs> he is Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the Latvatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford and a Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony College. But most of you will know him as the author of the Bottom Billion and the Plunder Planet. The latter actually had, in my observation, an enormous impact to, so that environmentalists and economists could understand that prosperity and climate protection must not contradict each other and can be and must be achieved together. I think also one of the fundamentals for the coalition and the government we have right now in Germany. If we fail in one, we fail in both, as Stern put it. And Stern once asked Paul to join him as a young academic at the World Bank. And now we have him here. Paul, we are welcome to our forum. And last but not least, we are honored to have Marietta Jäger here. She is the Deputy Director General for the European Commission's International Partnerships Directorate. And before joining the Commission in 2005, Mrs. Jäger was more than a decade working on the accession of Slovenia to the EU for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and whoever had participated in an assessing process knows what that means. Um, I have really to, yeah, to bow. Marietta, welcome to our forum. We start with uh, Dr. Kamukisha Kasaura. The question we are discussing concerns the future of humanity and the planet which your both academic and expertise and a practitioner in both fields, public and private. Could you share with us some of your thoughts concerning the question, what exactly is the case for transformative contracts? And also maybe from the African Union, what is it what the African Union needs when talking about contracts, infrastructure and energy? Kamagusha, the floor is yours. Thank, thank, thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity. I again I would wish to uh, convey the apologies of Our Excellency, the Commission of Infrastructure and Energy, who was uh, supposed to be with you. However, for some other unforeseen commitments, uh, has been unable to, to join you. So I will be here uh, representing her and, and, and the Commission. Um, first of all, let me uh, start by uh, uh, congratulating the German Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, in uh, cooperation with the uh, Connex Support Unit uh, for organizing this high-level forum uh, to discuss, share views and thoughts regarding uh, sustainable infrastructure development and the importance of investment contracts. Um, as, as I uh, approach to uh, maybe respond uh, to the question that which was posed uh, to me, I might give a bit of background and, and, and based on that, maybe I can link up with the, the question of transformative investment contracts and how it can help uh, the, uh, the, the AUC and its member states. Um, lack of modern infrastructure uh, is a major challenge uh, to our continent, uh, economic uh, development, and indeed constitutes a major impediment to the achievements of the continental, regional, and national development goals, including the Agenda 2063 goals and other objectives such as the UN Sustainable uh, Development uh, uh, Goals. Um, the, the African uh, infrastructure uh, needs are enormous, and I can give uh, figures like uh, the half of the African population has no access to electricity, 
uh, while we have challenging uh, power supplies with a lot of uh, uh, out, uh, routine uh, outages since the uh, infrastructure which is being relied upon was built in the 50s and 60s. That includes the generation plants, the transmission, as well as the distribution facilities. So the uh, proportion of the people in Africa also still depending on inefficient traditional energy uh, sources is higher than uh, any other continent. Despite the fact that um, ICT infrastructure has grown uh, these past few decades, uh, penetration, uh, Africa still lags behind uh, the rest of the world in the reach and quality of its ICT penetration and quality. The uh, key issues uh, compromising this growth of ICT in Africa really is mostly affordability. In general, uh, roads, water facilities, airports, seaports, railways, telecommunication networks, and energy systems infrastructure are pressing priorities for Africa as they um, provide the vital underpinnings of any prosperous economy. In fact, an improved infrastructure is among the countermeasures to be proposed and should be a major uh, component of any stimulus plan, both for responding to any uh, crisis and similar to COVID-19 pandemic and for building resilience over the long term. Uh, infrastructure development is one of the priorities for the African Union Commission uh, in terms of policy formulation, project coordination, and supporting uh, promotion. Thus, the African Union Summit uh, approved the development of the infrastructure mega programs projects as part of the Agenda 2063 flagship uh, programs. The uh, African Union Agenda 2063 has a wide and diverse scope of operations. Uh, geographically, it concerns the whole of the African continent covering all the 55 African mem Union member states. It is also far reaching in its social economic uh, aspects such as um, the planned continental infrastructure development projects uh, to be owned by all Africans, including African diaspora. The implementation involves as many African institutions, um, including new ones uh, for its implementation. It's a continental uh, strategy rolling plan with a short term of 10 years, uh, medium term 10 to 5 years, as well as long term to 5 to 50 years uh, component. So the AU uh, also has a program for infrastructure development in Africa, uh, which is dedicated to facilitating continental integration through uh, improved regional infrastructure. It builds on the master plan and priorities of the regional economic communities in three phases. Uh, the short term, uh, which was from 2012 to 2020, the uh, medium term, which is currently mm -hmm. being implemented 2020, 2030, as well as the long term, which will span from 2030 to 2040. PIDA covers four sectors, which is energy, transport, information, communication, as well as transboundary water. Uh, talking, you know, when we start talking about climate change, et cetera, we, we have to consider the uh, SD, SDG number seven, which is universal access to electricity, which is a key uh, to unlocking Africa economic potential. The availability of electricity is critical to growth uh, of industry, which in turn will increase production for domestic consumption, foreign exports, create more jobs, generate additional tax revenues, and ultimately result in increased development through the um, continent. You know, I'm covering some of these projects, the major projects, the major priorities within the continent, covering the different sectors, trying to link up uh, with, uh, the, the, uh, with the aim of the, the Connex uh, uh, strategy. So currently, the AU major AU, the, the major AU energy goals is to operationalize the Africa single electricity market and the continental uh, system master plan. The two AU initiatives are being coordinated by the African Union as well as Auda NEPAD and supported by the European Union as well as the African Development Bank with technical inputs and contributions from the Pan-Africa energy stakeholders. The, um, all these 
plans call for massive capital investment, both local and foreign, since most of the governments in Africa cannot mobilize the necessary uh, funding on their own, private capital is needed. Thus, there is a need for governments in Africa to adopt asset recycling. This will enable governments to unlock the capital they invested in profitable infrastructure, example, uh, roads, uh, power plants, airports, rails, and fiber optics networks. Um, and this now brings uh, the, uh, or the connection to the need to have this uh, connects in terms of supporting um, investment uh, contract negotiations. Uh, furthermore, development finance institutions will play a vital uh, role by providing risks, uh, uh, hedging uh, instruments, and credit um, enhancement, as well as support local currency financing to strengthen local capital markets. Through uh, such measures, uh, infrastructure will be underlined as an investment asset class, including for international and domestic institutional investors. I wish to maybe submit at this point and uh, maybe we'll be able to come in afterwards from after the contributions of the other uh, panel members. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for these first insights. What I took from it is um, saying, okay, there is enormous demand for development in Africa, which is... Merci uh, beaucoup d'avoir partagé ces premiers commentaires. Ce que j'en retiens, c'est qu'il y a uh, un besoin... Here. Um, yeah, enormous development need, and you do have programs, you do have a continent-wide and national strategy, um, it's uh, enormous amount of money is needed, investment are needed, and for this you need public-private partnership, of course, and here then will contracts come into place, uh, beside World Bank and other uh, uh, institutions that, that ob obviously also play a, a huge role here as stakeholders. Um, I, I leave it with this and then we'll just immediately go to Paul and I think later we can then come into a yeah, interaction with each other in the discussion. But thank you for laying out the ground and the needs and what has already been done. Um, Paul, in your books, you're not getting tired and I admire you for that, for not getting tired, to point out that restoring environmental order and eradicating global poverty are the two defining challenges of our area. From your perspective, what contribution can con contracts make to jointly achieve these goals of restoring the environment and eradicating of poverty? Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and... Um, uh, yes, I've been working on this for a long time. Um, I've never been working so hard on it. Um, uh, and um, I think I was in at the birth of Connex. And I would like to congratulate the German government of, of being able to continue a commitment to Connex, despite a complete change of government. Uh, and that is a model of continuity and partnership across different political parties to achieve an overarching common purpose. So I, I just wanted to thank you. I would say um, nothing would have kept me away from uh, being at this conference in person, except that this is the first day of a week-long conference on exactly the same theme that I'm hosting in Oxford. And I've got 50 people here um, and uh, I am, uh, the director of the course, and I need to be there all the time. So um, I have just um, excused myself on the grounds that I really have to do this. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but other than that, I would have been with you. And other than you, I would be with them. Um, <laughs> now let me say something substantive. Um, as the uh, as, as the representative of the African Union so articulately expressed, um, Africa needs uh, a lot of uh, big investments in infrastructure, and, um, and for that it will need a lot of private investment. Um, and for that it needs to make some commitments 
but it also needs to avoid some other commitments because um, the one of the main benefits of natural resources uh, is the tax revenues they bring. And so it's very important to um, avoid locking into some things, uh, but to make commitments to other things. So just let me explain that for a moment. Don't lock in too soon to things that are still very uncertain until they're resolved. Um, uh, for example, um, the, uh, the energy price is very high at the moment. Um, who knows what will happen to the energy price in the future? Um, uh, and we can at least anticipate that these price changes will happen. Um, we can't anticipate how they'll change, but we can build resilience by scenario planning, which, suppose, which says, suppose they went up very high, suppose they then went very low, what would we do? How would we structure contracts in a way that was mutually beneficial and yet um, satisfied all our concern, constraints? So anticipating the future means don't lock into some contracts, um, keep them open. Right? And there's a danger that some contracts have been locked in too soon. And, and as a result of that, are now generating too much revenue uh, for natural resource companies and too little for the country. So avoid such commitments and where, they are, where you're locked into them, find ways of unlocking. But, so that's one thing where you've got to actually extricate yourself from commitments you should never have made. Um, on the other hand, you need to anchor the uncertainties which are deterring um, uh, private investment. And it's quite clear that, um, uh, that the only way you can anchor these uh, put these anxieties to rest is by making some commitments that um, that that resolve the anxieties, um, and so that's the balance. You commit on the things that get rid of investor anxieties, but you avoid committing on things that lock you in to lousy contracts or to contracts that may become lousy because of events. Um, the, uh, the next thing I want to, to, to discuss, and I won't go on for very long, but um, you need to learn rapidly. When you're facing uncertainty, you need to learn rapidly, and you do that by experiments. Um, uh, I, it's a very good thing to start with a, a, a leadership that sets out very clear goals and then devolves decisions about how to achieve those goals to specialist teams. Uh, and for capturing the benefits of natural resources, you need a lot of specialist teams that work in parallel with different experiments. Some things work well, some things work badly. You can learn both from the successes and the failures. Um, in doing all this rapid learning, context is king. And by that, I mean that local knowledge, the sort of knowledge that only people in a country, in Africa, can have, they have that knowledge. And so they have to have the agency for taking decisions, not teams in Washington or wherever. Um, uh, foreigners don't know best. You know best, but you need to fuse the contextual knowledge you have with the generic knowledge and the experience from uh, from people that have done it elsewhere, succeeded elsewhere. Um, and so that's the, the fusing of the knowledge you can acquire from experiment, from learning from others, with the contextual knowledge that you have. And my final point is that you need to build partnerships which find common interests. 
And um, one sort of common interest is to avoid disputes um, by anticipating that changes will happen. You can't know what the changes will be, but you know there'll be these, there'll be changes, prices of volatile, for example, um, uh, all sorts of supply shocks that uh, are coming along as, a, as are happening at the moment. And so you need an environment which says, supposing these things happened, we suppose that was a scenario, how would we, uh, how would we avoid a dispute um, by finding um, mutually advantageous ways of solving that? And so anticipating change the, the fact that there'll be change, coming together in partnerships that say, what would work for both of us? What would work for the company and for the government? What would work for citizens and for the public sector and for the, and for the private sector? So dispute, resolu dispute, and dispute avoidance by partnerships that anticipate shocks and finally, rapid dispute settlement when they arise. And here the key principle is avoid a mentality of a zero sum gain. Avoid the sort of courtroom mentality of uh, if you win, I lose. So I'm going to win at all costs and you're going to lose. That's a very damaging mentality. Yeah. The essence of good dispute settlement is to build partnerships in which you discover new ways in which you can settle this dispute with ways that you hadn't thought about, but actually benefit both of you. That's the, mm -hmm. the principle of dispute settlement. It's a technique, it's a skill doing that. And that's the sort of thing that Connex can bring. So I think Connex is an enormously important initiative uh, nothing but what I'm doing here in Oxford here today would have kept me away from it, but congratulations. Um, shortly, I'm going to have to go back to my group, but I'm happy to take any questions in the next few minutes, by to all means. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, for this um, statement. Um, being a mediator myself, when, you, when I'm listening to you, uh, what you expect and how you actually perceive Connex and I, I simply heard, okay, it's actually a mediation center that supports um, the, the governments, not only with their expertise, but also with the process of how you actually deal with uncertainty, how you keep contracts open and make it more flexible because the future is open. And also this learn fast, but learning fast actually also requires an attitude that wants to learn and that is also open to make mistakes and learn from them. You call this the experimental thing. And that, of course, the perspective of the local people is so important because they do have the knowledge and that we can actually build partnership by anticipating that, of course, we will have disputes in the future. So it is crucial how we deal with these how we deal with these kind of disputes. Um, as a mediator, I would say we cannot avoid conflicts, but it is very crucial how we deal with these so that both go from the table as winners and not one wins and the other one loses on the account of the others. So far, thank you very much, Paul. We want to add something immediately because I wanted to go to Mayetta. Can you yeah, just give me because Mayetta is also still waiting. And I know she has lots of thought. Mayetta, I'm so glad you're here and you can make it. I know you're very, very busy. Um, from your EU perspective, what is it, what you're looking for? What is what you're expecting from an initiative like Connex? And I may also add already, maybe you want to answer it immediately or maybe later. From Paul, we learned that nature plus technique plus regulation results in prosperity. The EU is a huge um, regulator. So also, it's not only what you expect from Connex, but as a huge regulator and important regulator, what can you bring to the table and actually do so that um, this becomes a success? Mayetta, but we are happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So let me let me try again. First of all, to thank yeah. you for the kind invitation to the European Commission. Really, thank you to Connex Support Unit, and. Um, as you know, it has been said before, the European Commission has been strong supporter of Connex uh, from the beginning. And let me use this opportunity also to congratulate to the German government really on this initiative and on the follow up. And as you said, the European Union has always aimed at being really transformative in promoting social uh, and economic development both within the European Union and, of course, also beyond um, its borders, because uh, the economic progress is uh, embedded in our democratic values. And, of course, we would like to deliver lasting social and economic benefits to all communities. And this also brings us to the um, forefront of the responsible business practices and to tackle also our global challenges, especially in the times of crisis, as we are facing today. So uh, our previous speaker said uh, uh, how important the investments are, special investments in Africa and special needs. So we came with a um, global gateway as our offer to connect the world. And it is an investment offer to our partner countries, which intends really to increase the scale and impact and to focus on countries' key transformative objectives. Because we all know that the mining sector is of the key importance for achieving the uh, digital and green transformation. And it has been said before that the use of the global raw materials is, is expected to grow substantially and basically to double in decades ahead. I think that according to OECD, it should uh, increase to 167 gross tons by 2060. But at the same time, we know that uh, the mineral extraction plays a dominant role in like 63 economies. And um, we know that it's also a quarter of global GDP. But uh, I would say 70% of those uh, population across those countries live in the extreme poverty. So we believe that the extractive industry plays a key role in lifting people out of the poverty and the growing demand for the critical raw materials presents opportunities to support the energy and digital transition, as I said. That's why for the EU partner countries, this is an enormous opportunity to uh, promote the sustainable investments and to develop the value chains and local value addition as uh, was said before, in capacity. And uh, yes, we believe in strong partnerships and we are supporting partnerships in the global gateway that amounts of 300 billion of investments. The first uh, step is the Africa investment uh, package was 150 billion and it's part of so-called the enhanced uh, partnership that was uh, agreed at the EU AU summit. But um, also, the, um, from the African uh, Union Commission uh, uh, speaker said that uh, mining investments and associated infrastructure projects generate, uh, generate basically enormous costs. Uh, and uh, as such, the transparent level playing field accompanied by efficient regulatory and administrative processes, in particular on contractual requirements, is really vital for achieving transformative sustainable development based on the quality interventions. And therefore we support Connex because the well-negotiated contract stating that take into account the social and economic uh, externalities, those are key. And also they provide investors certainty that they need uh, when facing the risk of unfair and discrim discriminatory business practices. So I can go now uh, with all the examples of our cooperation, not only on the Connex, but also with the Extractive in Industries Transparency Initiative, 
but also, you know, a long list of what we do with the European uh, Union uh, um, with, and with the African Union Commission. So, for example, we support the African uh, Mineral Development Center that will be launched at the beginning of October in Addis. And uh, I would also like to mention that we do so because we do believe that the transparency and good governance uh, are the cornerstone of policy in this uh, area. So just to say why we are such a believer in Connex, because we believe it's crucial in supporting our partner countries in contractual negotiations. Uh, really this results in more predictable and mutually fair uh, contract negotiations. For us, this is key and it is also attracting responsible investments in the sector at the time of the growing uh, demand. But moreover, it really serves to avoid the mistakes and insufficiencies that could result in the contractual damage, potentially reaching the billions of uh, euros. And uh, examples of the success uh, were uh, put before by the keynote speaker, um, Dr. Barbel Koffler, and she also quoted the examples of Liberia, of Panama, I may add Argentina, but uh, we need to do more because we would like to promote the responsible and sustain sustainable mining practices going beyond the formal sector, including also artisanal and small scale mining sector. We all know that uh, we have around 50 million with the trade part, also 150 million in uh, this business and the lack of the health and safety measures uh, often pose health risk uh, for minors um, that can be fatal. And also I'm talking about social protection and labor abuses, including children. The minor sector sees more than the worst cases of the forced and child labor. So here we also believe that the sound and fair contracts can have a transformative effect and uh, as they have a key role to play in ensuring the good and fair working conditions and social protections of the worker. And this is something that we would like to continue to work with Connex and uh, also with uh, tackling um, the many challenges of the ASM sector. And here we also have a partnership uh, for responsible minerals and support to the um, mineral regulation of OECD to the due diligence okay. guidance. So finally, let me say two words about the yeah. Global Gateway. As I said, this is our comprehensive strategy to bring major investments. And of course, uh, uh, the Global Gateway goes beyond development cooperation. And it is, sorry, someone is talking. So should I continue or should I stop the speaker? Distinguished uh, yes, speaker, uh, can I can fine. I conclude? <laughs> Basically, yes, I would just like ask. to say yeah. that um, uh, the global gateway is designed to leverage resources from the private sector and uh, really goes uh, hand in hand with the public and private uh, financial institutions, and it's being uh, really rolled out in the Team Europe uh, approach. But uh, let me conclude that uh, it's crucial to ensure the local value addition. At the moment, so I don't know if if the somebody from the regie is is, is uh, loud or I don't know who is this. No idea, but uh, okay. Let me yeah. just conclude that um, yeah. <laughs> uh, since we believe in the contractual power of negotiations, uh, as I said, not only for yeah. good and the legally sound uh, contracts that can bring a lot of future. Uh, prosperity and uh, revenues uh, mobilization in our partner countries, but also better working conditions and the local value that adopt into an integral part of the contractual negotiations. I think that uh, this is the future and the Connex initiative in central in all these partnerships mm. that we are putting together. So we are therefore really looking forward to continue our cooperation with Connex and to improve the transparency contractual obligations, governments, and uh, transparency. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay with you for a long time. So I have five more <laughs> minutes if you have any yeah. question. 
but I can just uh, say our commitment to Connex will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayetta. It's, it's good to know that at the European Commission, somebody is who really has the broad horizon of all the problems and takes all the challenges and, and yeah, ambiguities of these issues very serious. Um, what I also heard from you is that you're saying, OK, we have to do more. Uh, I don't know if you can say this in public, but does it also mean that the European Commission actually will invest more into these kind of initiatives to support negotiation support services? Is that already clear? <laughs> we are absolutely uh, I'm going to analyze all the yeah. initiatives. <laughs> And uh, from the previous experiences, as you may see, I mean, we've been supporting uh, heavily all yeah. the initiatives uh, that go into that direction. And I do not uh, know any reasons why we should not continue with that in the future. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you all to all the others uh, that, that you joined us and shared your views. I know you have to run to, to the next meeting. Mayetta, thank you very much. All the best for you. Um, this was the first panel on um, our Connex High Level Forum on investment contracts. Uh, we will now have a short break of uh, 15 minutes. Um, I would like to thank all our panelists for sharing their views with us. Uh, the case for transformation contracts now a little bit, bit clearer. I also learned again from Paul that um, the way actually contracts are negotiated is crucial, that for an uncertain future, we need to, to, to create clauses in the contracts that actually open up and don't lock in the people. Um, and I think that's something that is so obvious that it, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's easy to implement in, in these kind of contracts. Uh, I always call this uh, to prepare for the, for the expectable uh, surprises that the future uh, has in store for us. Um, also this kind of, we need to learn while, and we need to learn fast, that's something that at least in companies is already uh, a, a given factor. And I think it's also important for governments. Um, thank you all. I think, I don't know if Kamu Gisha is still with us, um, so I could ask him a question. Or did he also have to leave? I can't see him anymore. Okay, so in our next session, we will hear about a few examples, story that will demonstrate that we actually can make it make a difference. And I'm really looking forward to this because nothing can explain better um, that things actually work and how they work uh, than examples. And so we see each other uh, again, but I see that Kamu Gisha is still there. No, it's not there. So we see each other at 2.50 in, in um, what is this? At, at 2.15 Berlin time. And until then, we have a break, yeah? Uh, see you then. Thank you very much so far.